Hi, I'm Maggie Onisorgan. I'm the new Public Programs and Relations Manager here at the Amerind. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us for a creative collaboration, a dialogue between artist and collector, a candid conversation with master jeweler um, Dwayne Moctima, Hopi and Laguna Pueblo, and longtime collector Joanne Conrad. Before we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge that the Amerind is located in Southern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Ashwi, Uemi, and Apache families lived for untold generations, and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all of these communities rich in history have to teach us. Thank you to all our members and donors who enable the Amarin to provide these free online programming and fulfill Amarin's mission to foster and promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist the Amerind in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit amerind.org. Please also join us on April 29th at 11 o'clock. We will have Dr. Michael Searcy speaking on new insights into the old period in Casas Grandes, 10 years of Viejo period research in Northern Mexico. And on Saturday, May 13th, 11, we will have Dr. Elisa Lapando speaking on prehistoric jewelry from the sea. She will focus on the ornamental use of shell among the early agriculture communities of the Sonoran Desert. Please visit the events page on Amarin's Facebook page or website, amarin.org, for registration and details on these and other upcoming events. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, Dwayne Moctima. He's a master jeweler metalsmith. His work reflects and is inspired by his Hopi and Laguna Pueblo heritage. Dwayne graduated from Northern Arizona University's College of Creative Arts and has gone on to have an extensive career over the last 49 years. He has won numerous awards and accolades throughout his career as a working artist. In addition to selling in the best galleries, his pieces are held by several museums worldwide, including the Amarins. Dwayne's work is widely collected and lives on as heirloom pieces for many distinguished collections and patrons. Dwayne has also been a source of encouragement and empowerment for many artists through his role as a teacher, mentor, advocate, and friend, making him one of the most highly respected contemporary artists working today. And today, Dwayne will be speaking with Joanne Conrad. Joanne's deep interest in Native art and Southwest culture began as a child in Tucson. Returning to Arizona after a legal career, she now devotes her time to learning as much as possible about indigenous artists and their work. Her collection began many years ago with a teeny silver roadrunner pin and now includes examples of Hopi, Pueblo, Diné, Zuni, Apache, Tejono, and Pasquayaki handcrafted works. She credits places like the Amaranth with providing the resources to learn more about the artists and their cultures. If you would like to ask any questions during this presentation, uh, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box and we will collect those and share them with our speakers at the end of the presentation. Also, a link to today's recording will be sent to all the Zoom registration. And now I will turn it over to our speakers, Dwayne and Joanne. Thank you very much. Oh, well, good morning. Uh, People who are viewing this uh, webinar, uh, I'm Dwayne Moktaima, and my um, good friend, kindred sister, and collector of Dwayne Moktaima works, Joan Conrad. And uh, we welcome you very uh, much uh, for this uh, attending our webinar. We have an unusual um, dialogue this morning uh, between uh, Joan and I, and sharing that with you, the audience, about. Um, that di the, uh, how would you say, the, uh, the, the uh, I guess the uh, appreciation of a collector uh, to an artist and vice versa. I very much, Joan, I've gotten to know, uh, God, I guess uh, six years now. And, um, you know, you very rarely find people 
that understand an artist. And um, Joan herself is creative. She's she's an artist in her own right. Um, but it's just it's just overwhelming, in my opinion, to see somebody who gets me. And I really, really am thankful to Joan. Thank you, Joan, for all your your patronage, your incentive to allow me to to do some amazing things for you. And I think that's just for an artist. That's just uh, that's our that's our goal. And uh, and and I guess in our careers is to have somebody that just gives you an idea and then lets me be. She always tells me you have the creative license. Turn me loose. Yeah, yeah. She turns me loose. So you can talk a little bit about yourself, Joan, if you like. I've, I've always loved Native American art. And when I met Dwayne, he was so amazing. And he's at the top of his game. He's at the top of the food chain. So yeah. to work with him, and all I need to do is come up with an idea. It could be just a color or a design or the outline of a mountain. And I just tell him about the idea, and he runs with it. And, and I, I like to see him do that, do his own thing, and take just an invisible concept and turn it into something real in the real world. It's amazing. It's like magic. Yeah, one of the things Joan is really good at comprehending is uh, she's being an, uh, an artist of her own, like I said, of her, in her own right, is I, I will sketch some, or she sends me sketches. She'll give me an idea sketch, and then I elaborate on that sketch more. I'll do, I'll refine the sketch and then show it to her. And then we discuss it, we talk about it. But that's the true essence of, um, uh, I would just say a collector patron with an artist is to get something that they are really going to appreciate something very innovative mm -hmm. and very creative and um, it has so much more uh, uh, you know to me uh, intrinsic value to it and that's what I think is phenomenal about working with Joan all these years and I mean I've done a lot of pieces for her already and we still have a few more to go yeah she's got to give me yeah, we've given, she's given me some great ideas, and um, I, I'm very, very appreciative of, of you know, Joan, people like Joan, and uh, the Amory Museum, uh, where I'm now artist in residence. We're doing this uh, webinar from the Amory Museum, where I've been here since January. Uh, so I'm here four months. I'll be here through the end of April, and uh, this is also another uh, phenomenal uh, setting for me to be in. Uh, I'm isolated. Uh, we, we're a public uh, living exhibit here, but that's been over now. We've closed uh, that part for uh, two weeks ago, but uh, next year I'll be back again and uh, look forward to it. Anyway, uh, I guess we're ready to start this. Uh, this first piece is a, a scarf slide as labeled. And this is one of the, probably not the first piece that I did for Joan, but this is when uh, she gave me a, a creative license to do she, she, Joan uh, likes to dress kind of Western, modern Western. And uh, so she gave me this incentive to do, she said she wears scarves a lot. So I, I showed her these Marinci nugget stones that I have that are vintage. And uh, you had them in a jar. I had them in a jar for 30, over 35 years stored in a shed. And, uh, and I found them, I was amazed. And I, so I brought them to the Amarin. I hadn't done anything with them. Uh, at all since I collected, bought them 35 years ago. And Joan, I showed Joan my stash of materials and she says, oh my God, you know, I wear scarf slides around. So she had me do this piece. So I did a drawing and I sent her, text her the drawing and she loved it and she said, go for it. So this is, um, yeah, what the, oh. Yeah, there you go. This is uh, another piece. Um, but feel free to jump in, Joan, about your, um, you know, what, what you thought about the piece. And this is another piece that was, um, Joan uh, loved this piece. And it, the amazing thing about it was it was the right size for her. And then she saw it. And it's classic Dwayne. It's got that streamlined contemporary look and, and the beautiful use of stones and the, the perfection of the setting of the stones. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did something different here on this piece. Uh, if you notice on the inlay part, it comes to like on the ends, they're both uh, like a like a triangle. Um, the black jade, that's, the materials in this stone um, bracelet is black jade, uh, blue chalcedony, opal, 
uh, Arizona zebra jasper and calcasiderite. And uh, I also majored in, I went to school, like, like Maggie mentioned, at Northern Arizona University, and I also majored in painting. So colors are not intimidating to me at all. The reason I do put gold spacers in between the stones is for the fact that whenever you put uh, that gold material, it allows the stones to just be more prolific. It, it, so, most some of these stones are semi or uh, so have some sort of translucence to it. So the gold actually brightens up the color of the material, which is, it's almost like looking at it in natural daylight. And uh, so that's why I put gold spacers in. Well, sometimes I use silver, it depends on the customer, but most customers um, like the gold in between the stones. It just, it just makes the stones stand out more. <clears throat> also, this piece has uh, 14 karat gold accents. And a lot of my designs, um, like this swirl design, is uh, uh, my idea or my thinking proce uh, about process of uh, how the world began or how it was shaped. Uh, when the beginning of the world or so, so to speak. So it's cosmic. Those symbols to me are like, like, like the, um, like the galaxy and the planets and how the earth was formed. And those are the, how would you say the, the, the little circles and the squares are like the, the, the molecules of the earth. That's my, my sense of, of uh, and then you, it, it's what created the, the stones in the world. And the shape of the bracelet is it's a hollow fabricated piece so it, it it looks massive but it's very light and and this piece in particular took like seven soldering steps to complete to get to where now i can do the inlay part you know once i do the soldering it's a lot of a uh, lot of fabrication a lot of thought process goes into how this piece is going to be made in the normal uh inlay work of this nature um, you know, a lot of artists would uh, just grind the stones to, to the silver, like they inlay them in, they glue them in, and, uh, and then they grind the material to the metal. And, but this piece is, was a whole other challenge because, because of the texture on, this, on the side where that triangle B part comes into the, into the bracelet. I, I would lose, I would grind a lot of silver down if I was to do that. So I had to had to come up with a whole new process of doing that whole inlay piece on top in one piece, and like a like a cabochon, I um, I have a way of of gluing a backing underneath it, and then I take the whole thing out. I have to do it really quick once I get the glue in there, and set it. It's pressure fitted into the into the bracelet, and then I pop it out just before the glue sets, so it doesn't it does, it's not stuck in the silver work. It's a real nervous uh, time, time frame of, 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 of working this material. So I pull it out and then let it cure, which takes 48 hours to, to where I can go ahead and I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll put it back in, scrape all the excess glue on the sides, stick it back into the bracelet, clean that up, and then I'll trace a line where the silver meets the material and then go back and get that angle. I always facet my, uh, my stones for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is to allow uh, light to penetrate into the stones or to give it also another three-dimensional aspect. Mm -hmm. And then also um, what it does is it makes my work truly unique. It shows um, a craftsmanship that you have to master to do this. And uh, you know, just it's just a lot more time consuming, but that's what people have uh, come to know about uh, collecting my work. Yeah, that's instantly recognizable as your work. Yeah. That's what I call your Rolls Royce bracelet. Yeah, the, she named it the Rolls Royce bracelet. And, uh, you know, because it has uh, just has that really silver, gold, and black jade. So, um, <clears throat> next slide is um, a, uh, she gave also, Joan is, loves to collect things so one day you can go ahead and tell the story Joan, about your this piece well this is a, a typical example where i get the idea and wayne runs with it i had the notion that i needed a meteorite and i love Kato's. i do archery and i love Kato's. so I, I just searched for a meteorite and lo and behold 
Santa Fe has a store that's a meteorite store. Oh, and yeah. I, I found an Arizona meteorite, and it actually, if you see it in the sunlight, you can see tiny diamonds in the meteorite itself. It, it glows. So I gave it to Dwayne, and he put it in his pocket of his jeans. I said, here, see what you can do with it. And this is what he came up with, with the, the arrows and with his textured work on the silver. And it's just an amazing piece. Well, one of the things I, when I, when Joan gave me this piece, I was, I had always wanted to do something like this and it was going to be so different. And uh, another, another, um, uh, which is a hobby that Joan and I share is archery. I was always, uh, since I was probably 19 years old, uh, 49 years ago, I was already an archer. And so, um, through that experience of being an archer, I wanted to know, you know, we didn't, uh, to my, through my own people, my, my, both my Hopi side and my Laguna Pueblo side was I, my elders was talking to them about, you know, uh, bow, bow, bow and arrow, you know, and, uh, and so, um, we still have a, a group, you know, the, the war uh, chief and his assistant in the, in the villages. You know, uh, they always carry bows and arrows. And so, uh, my one of my Indian native names of Laguna Pueblo is Gaistu. And Gaistu, uh, um, I got this name because of a, a grand great grandfather that we had an extended family at Laguna Pueblo. And so, my grandfather, being seen me carrying my bows and arrows around when I was, you know, uh, 19 years of age and always prolifically shooting, but we had, I was in school at NAU at the time and we had an archery range in Flagstaff. And so I was always constantly out there every time I had a chance to get out and shoot my bow and arrow. And so when I met Joan here at the Ameren, you know, well, lo and behold, she was in archery. So, and also uh, at Adel. Yeah, so she she brought an Adel out one time and we played around in the big meadow of the museum for a whole afternoon. And I, I mean, it was a natural, I, she said I had a natural, um, I don't know, ability to throw it. And it, did, it just took me one, one time and I already had that. Ready to hunt. Yeah, I had the, the knack for it. And so I just feel like my name served me well, my, my <laughs> native name, Kaistua. So anyway, when Joan gave me this meteorite and already getting to know her, that's the part of, uh, a designer and collector is the fact that I get to know the spirit of the person that is asking me to do something. So it was a no brainer to come up with something of this nature. Again, relating to the, um, the, 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 the formation around the meteorite is basically like the movement of the, of the, the planetary or the cosmic world, you know, in that world, those are like the waves of, the meteorite going through space and pushing itself. You know, their air is a mass itself. So that's what that is. And also what Tito's represent is uh, it's worn by the war clan or war society or the ceremonial dancers who are going to be dancing in Pueblo ceremonial dances. And it's always worn on the, the left side or if you're, because uh, that's where you use it when you shoot your bow. And, uh, you know, way, way back, they were just big pieces of leather until, you know, they, these, these are more or less fancy ornamental uh, kitos or bogards. In the Karasin language, it's called Amish to Artushkeni, which is really hard to pronounce. So I'll just go along with Kito because that's a lot easier. That's a Navajo word for, uh, uh, or Diné word for uh, bogard. And uh, that's what that represents. The four uh, arrowheads is basically uh, another, as the meteor right enters the, 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 the Earth's gravity and the atmosphere, um, to find something like this, even in, in historic native culture, was a true essence of, of, you know, if you found something, it was like, it was like a treasure. So what, what the four arrowheads represent is just the blessing of, uh, of, of having something like this. And then the, 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 the border, the parameter are, are called sky bands. And you'll see these on pottery designs, 
basically uh, it's just a simple way of uh, honoring the, the clouds and the, the skyline. And uh, also it's a, a lightning pattern. If you look at it that way, many different people will look at this in many different forms. So, but I, as a designer, I just wanted to, you know, show something that was uh, complimentary to the meteorite. She had me set it in gold, which was, was, a, was a, a good point for her to give me that suggestion. So I have it set in a 22 karat gold bezel. And um, that way it just, it, oh, you know, all the, what a meteor uh, encompasses too, is a lot of unique minerals, you know, minerals that we don't even have on or very uh, here on earth, or maybe we have some here, but that just shows how we're connected to the whole interplanetary, you know, cosmos. So that's what that was. It was an honor to do this piece with it. We'll go to the next piece, which is, uh, this is again a, a symbolic, simple overlay, a plate on plate, I call it, a fabricated uh, pendant that I had, Joan came out for a visit one afternoon in a couple of years ago to the Ameren Museum when I was a resident artist here. And she, this piece was in the case and it was funny, but I had just finished it. And for some reason I said, this is something I know Joan will like. And sure enough, she saw that she had me pull it out right away. And again, this is kind of a, a typical Southwest design, plate on plate, but honoring the clouds, those are cloud. Uh, and you'll see this um, um, symbol, uh, that's not a cross, but it's uh, basically like the crossroads of where we, the, my interpretation is the crossroads of where we're at in present day life. And you can either go either way, northwest, southeast, and also it's the, it's the, it, it would be uh, synonymous with people moving in all those directions as we see today. And, um, you know, we, we, the cloud, the upper version are clouds. The lower versions are the valleys and the canyons and the mesas. That's what that represents. I like this piece because a lot of artists would have taken the design and kept it flat, but you made it curved. Oh yeah. Which I thought was pretty amazing. And I also like the way you texture the background. Yeah. The textures I do like this particular piece is a tool <coughs> texture. So it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work here in finesse to get in there and texture all this by hand uh, with a with a tool. And so I do not only the, the in the background, but I also do the back. And so, it looks simple, but it's not. Yeah. We'll go to the next slide. Oh God, this is amazing here. This is uh, the shell form, a shell form, which means it's hollow uh, buckle. And uh, it's it's of a water serpent design and uh, which typically everybody knows as Avanyu, which is a Tewa uh, name. And uh, sterling silver with gold accents inlaid with semi-precious stones of black jade, uh, Arizona zebra jasper, The you can tell which that is. Uh, the white is pristine, which is a natural color. To, it's in the area of dolomite. And this comes from um, uh, Apache Junction, Arizona. The zebra stone comes from um, Prescott, Arizona, and I use black jade, which is uh, from Flagstaff, Arizona. And the upper stone in the above the next to the black jade on the top portion is called calcasiderite, or they also this looks like what people know as white buffalo uh, turquoise. And the stone below that is, an, is a green opal, kind of a greenish tone or a brown opal with brown matrix better. Anyway, this piece was sitting on my desk in the, in the work studio at the Ammon, being an artist in residence. And Joan came to visit one time and she's always very curious. I always, uh, I'm, I'm always excited to let her look at my bench. Cause there, I work on, I don't just work on one piece. And Joan knows this because she sees my bench, but to me, it looks like a mess, but it's work in progress of maybe 20 or more pieces sitting on my, my jewelry bench. So I, I was excited to show just the, the buckle part. It hadn't had the design on it yet and uh, the Vanu design. And so I had, been, I had had this piece for close to 10 years, just sitting there on my bench, wondering 
when I was ever going to get around to finishing it. But, but I believe in fate. I, this is the thing about an, a, an artist's way of life is we do things just to kind of get it started and we toss it aside and we, we just wait for that day when somebody will notice, recognize it and say, oh my, I have an idea for that. And Joan I'm came in. To speak to you. Yeah. yeah. And Joan came in one day and I showed her. She, she saw it there, I think. And it was on the corner of my bench. She said, what's that about? So I picked it up and showed it to her. And she goes, you know what I see? And she goes, I see, I see a Navanyu on this piece. So I, you know, I said, wow, that is a great idea. So I drew a sketch and I texted it or emailed it to Joan and she loved it and said, go for it. And uh, there I go. I, I was just so excited to do this piece with her. It was a lot of work because every one of these pieces, again, the, uh, all the little pieces that inlay on the four corners, the four ends of the, the buckle the, the in the main center portion, those are all cut and then glued together, epoxy glued together. Before I set them into the piece, I have, again, that same process as I did the bracelet. Uh, it's a lot of extra work, but it just, the, the outcome is just so amazing. And it, this, this piece took, I don't know, probably 80 hours to make, uh, cause I don't work on it all the time. I, otherwise I'll burn out. I, I, that's why I work on other things. It's just a discipline that I've developed uh, to, uh, to do that. So, uh, just an awesome piece, Joan. Do you have anything you want to add? No, except I was wearing it in Tucson one day and a stranger walked up to me and said, did Dwayne make that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's an honor. Uh, people now uh, doing this all these years, uh, people recognize my work mm -hmm. because of, mainly because of the inlay, the facet I, that I put on my stones. And also the colors are very dynamic and unique. Uh, that again, I reflects my painting background. The reason I didn't stick with painting was because I, um, I have a younger brother, Joe Moktaima, who ended up being a painter. So I didn't want to interfere with his uh, discipline. And then also in our pueblos of Laguna, the Eastern pueblos of New Mexico, we're actually not allowed to do paintings uh, or um, like, like uh, paints. Uh, that there is because of a uh, cultural religious uh, uh, respect they have, they, you know, for those that particular type of uh, uh, media. So anyway, um, next item. Oh, this is a phenomenal piece. Yeah, one, oh, one. Go back. We can go to this one. The lightning bracelet. Yeah, there you go. Oh, no, let's skip. So anyway, this is uh, titled. Lightning bracelet. One day I had this, I made this, uh, first I did the, the, the zigzag patterning on a, on a silver blank. And so um, I had this idea that uh, sometimes I do think of what I'm gonna do on this piece. I wanna do something very, very different. And when I think of different, I think of Joan Conrad, because I said, she was gonna come visit me uh, again uh, a couple years ago and I decided well she's going to come out I'm going to I got to do something to show her some something new and unique something very very different so I when I was sitting here and I thought about you know what I, I, I did just got this beautiful blue moon turquoise which is mined uh, in Nevada and it's in within the Royston turquoise area owned by the Audison family that they're prolifically known for mining turquoise, and uh, they have a uh, actually did a documentary on um, on I think TV television. You know what network it was, but uh, look just look up um, a turquoise in, in in YouTube or one of those movie channels, and you might find it. But anyway, their stones are just beautiful. They're very there's the the turquoise material of the the Royston and the Tonopah Valley, where they're located, those particular Nevada stones, they have so much integrity. And the integrity is, is the uh, actual, the, 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 the unique uh, hardness of the material. It looks soft, but it's very hard. It's gem quality. And it's gem quality. And the reason I, I love that material is because a lot of times, like I said, I facet my stones 
So they're going to be a little bit raised up above the metal, the, the bezel area, which holds the stones. And so what that allows me to have that confidence when I finish that they're not going to chip, they're not going to break, you know, and uh, that's one of the qualities of, of doing quality work is thinking of all those little factors that in the end result, because I hate getting things back. I don't want to repair nothing. I will do it for free of the own, the lifetime of the owner that owns these pieces. Yeah, but a lot of times you can't help it. Maybe they 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 hit hit a wall or something with their bracelet and the chips. And uh, I'll be glad to take care of it. You know, if it's that kind of an accidental, uh, you know, um, abrasion to the to the turquoise or the bracelet. So anyway, this piece uh, again was done like I explained before. I wanted the bracelet to be because how can I facet the edges with this with the stones glued in? So these all had to be separately cut and put in there. And and so there's are all blue moon turquoise. They have some spider web like on the on the end. And then there's there there are tones of greens and blues. And uh, when Joan saw it, she definitely loved it. And uh, I was just honored to know where it's at. <laughs> and it looks like one long piece of turquoise, but it's actually several carefully cut pieces put together. Yeah. And this piece actually because was was the finesse of this piece was that I had to make the bracelet first, which is a shape, which is a rounder shape. And then I had to make the bezel part, but I can't solder it through the piece. So what I had to do was get a piece of metal uh, to, to the match the bracelet shape and then grind down the bezel part, make it extra high and thick to where I would grind it and solder it to, the, to that uh, uh, underplate. And then it would be match exactly the, where the bracelet's going to fit, and so it's riveted onto, you know, the the silver work. That's another thing I do a lot. I do a lot of riveting uh, for that reason. But I love this piece. Oh, this is uh, one of Joan's coup de gras pieces, and she's wearing it today. You can show that how it looks on your own. Yeah, she's wearing it today, and. Um, yeah, it's it's another uh, Joan. Like I said, is an artist, uh, and she likes to sketch. And she takes walks in the desert. And she was telling me about this one spot she likes to sit and draw. Uh, and so she sent me. She said one day she, um, oh, this is probably a year ago, I think. She came and said, Dwayne, I have this idea. She brought me. This. I bought this. I found this natural copper at the International Gem Show, I think she said. And it was kind of a shape of a heart. You can't tell here, but it looks because of the angle of the um, of the, the copper. And she said, I want it to be just left alone as it is. And so you can see the, the, the crystallization of the copper in the dark area. Uh, it looks like crystals of copper, but oxidized dark. And so she said, uh, just what I have this idea, I want this wide bracelet, you know, like a desert landscape. And I have these pictures. And first she sent me the pictures. And then uh, then after that, I said, uh, well, how do you want this piece to look? She sent a whole bunch of pictures. And I thought, can you do a sketch for me? And she did. She gave me a rough outline sketch of like what she wanted on the bracelet. So this this is the very front view of the bracelet. And well, it's kind of off-centered a little bit. It's not right in exactly in the center. And then this is one side view, the sun coming up over the desert mountains and uh, what lives on the desert, you know, roadrunners and other animals. And she was fascinated by a story I was telling about the roadrunners. Uh, she came into the studio and was looking at my, my silver uh, templates one day and designs. And she, uh, she was asking, uh, you know, what's the story behind this roadrunner? So I was telling her that um, way, way back when the Great Spirit put us, our people, in the places we currently are, we had to migrate from somewhere else. And the last plan to leave the, because of um, something unique about their, their, their tracks was the roadrunner plan. And when you see a roadrunner track, you can't tell if it's where it's going, if it's coming or going. And the reason is so that the, the, the bad people or the witches or the evil spirits couldn't follow the migration. And she goes, oh, I want that. I got to have that on my bracelet. Because uh, Joan is very um, 
uh, in, 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 I would just say confident about uh, her, her good side and she didn't want anything, uh, you know, get in the way, so to speak, of her life. And so, you know, this is again, another, another big um, spirit uh, that we use a motif and actually the, the spirit itself, the eagle, which um, you'll see eagles down here in the desert, especially in the winter time, because they migrate from up way up north, Canada, Alaska, and uh, the northern states of the United States. They'll migrate down here to the desert. And if you're lucky, you'll see them soaring around. And uh, and so, and then again, the same thing as the Tana Atam, I have a lot of respect for the tribes who still live here, the Atam people, the Yaqui. Uh, we all have that symbolic reference to uh, respect of eagles and what they represent. You know, they're the, how would you say, the, 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 the a part of the cloud people. You know, they're the ones that, uh, how would you say, uh, uh, soar the skies, you know, to um, take our prayers. And we use a lot of eagle feathers in our culture. And that's the reason why is because um, they're the ones that soar to the cloud people and can take our prayers and songs, you know, when we use their feathers on, on in ceremonials. And of course, the other, the desert landscape of the Saworo, she was always telling me about this special Saworo that she would sit under and she, what was the name of it? We called it old grandfather. Old, old, old grandfather. Yeah, old yeah, she called him the old man and she would sit there and talk to him, you know, which, yeah, I talked this morning. Yeah, well, it's not, it's, we do as native people. That's why I love Joan in a kindred way is because we talk to the animals, the plants, the trees all the time and out of respect because they're living uh, uh, things here on this earth. So that's one of the respects that we grew up being Native American. And it might sound phony to a lot of people, but that's the, actually, that's what grounds us. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps us, uh, righteous here on earth to be a uh, liaison for everything living on this earth, this planet. That's why we're so, um, as an artist, and as a, as a um, uh, how would you say, a, uh, a representative, a mentor of, of what's good in this world in my art is that we also have to respect the environment. And I'm very much so about that being native. And um, Joan, when she mentioned about the Saworo, I, I understood exactly what she was talking about. Because I do when I'm up in the mountains and I, I do a lot of archery hunting. And I find sometimes these big giant, I mean, they're like the the, the big redwoods. They're, they're very few, but they might be a Douglas fir or a blue spruce or a ponderosa pine. And they're huge. They didn't get cut when they were logging, you know, back in the early 1900s. And uh, right away, I take my offerings out and pray to that, that huge big tree because you, you have to think of the life, they what they saw in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that was really an amazing piece to, to, to accomplish. <clears throat> so this brings us up to um, um, a piece that Joan had me do this year. She had actually, it took a year for me to get, get, it, get to it and get it done, which is not unordinary these days for me to do a masterpiece. Talking about the Roadrunner hat band uh, she bought a new hat and wanted me to do a nice hat band for it. And at first, at first I thought it was going to be a simple uh, project and put a, you know, make a bunch of these silver pieces and put them on a leather strap. But then I, you know, when, um, when I looked at the hat itself, it, the hats are tapered, the crown, the, the top part, not the brim, but the part that goes up to your, over your, your, your uh, forehead. And it's tapered. So when I put a strap on it, just, just a leather strap, I noticed there was a big gap and uh, around the top part. And so, you know, I would have to make, um, a, a, how would you say, cut the leather in, a, in an unordinary way, like kind of a semi-oval. And then, you know, it was going to, and then I also thought about another thing. If I was just to put a keeper, which is the, what, what slides onto the leather, you, you would see the keeper because you know, that wouldn't look good proper. So I, the next, the, the one thing I thought about that was going to be, oh no, here we go. This is going to be a project. You know, <laughs> it was a project. It was a project. It took me, again, 80 hours to make this piece to get it just to fit perfectly around the whole hat and measuring 
and I had to get all the proportions measured. And I had to actually make like a, a, a template and I did it out of paper. And um, so then I ended up coming up with the idea of just doing links. And uh, the, the symbolism in this piece are, if you notice that this is the sun face, the, the Tawa in Hopi or in Laguna language is called Ushraj. And uh, he is the great spirit. What are, he's, a, he's the, the source of our existence here on this planet earth so without without our great sun father the great spirit nothing would be we wouldn't we wouldn't see what we see today nothing would grow nothing would would be living it would just be a dark planet like the moon so anyway that's what he's he's the for, the foremost um talking again and reiterating that story about the roadrunner clan uh joan wanted this for the reason that it was going to be around her head so that all her thoughts are, would have clarity uh, of having the road runner spirit on. That's, that's the, uh, the, how would you say, the uh, ambition, uh, the idea of this project, this piece. And the, the next to the, the, the Tawa is the, the shape of the road runner tracks. And then in between are the road runners, the road runners themselves. This is a side view. And uh, once I got this all figured out, I got real. I get real excited when I'm almost to the end. It took a lot of planning, a lot of um, uh, effort to get to where this point was, and then finally, uh, this is my wife Jan modeling the the hat. And uh, the last one, the last little link in between, in the back, in the center, is the migration symbol. With it's a, can't see it really that well here, but. Um, and then the two rotor tracks on top and bottom of it. And you'll see a lot of these um, tracks of different birds. Like if you go to petroglyph areas, I remember as a kid, one time we used to go to this area uh, south of Holbrook where, we, where I grew up. My dad had a, a job there working for the Forest Service in the business uh, accounting area. And we used to go picnic out in south of Holbrook a lot of times in, in the desert. And we used to have, we had this place where we'd go and there was a lot of big sandstone slabs just flat on the ground. And uh, one time uh, we were very familiar with it because that area, because it was out towards Woodruff, Arizona. And uh, that's a, uh, that Woodruff, it was a, there's a butte, a volcanic butte there. And that's a sacred site for the Hopi people. So that we knew, we, we had gone rabbit hunting there and we had picnics there. But there was this one rock that had this amazing, huge a maze, and it had a bird track right in the middle. So one time I asked my grandma, I was a young boy, maybe 11 years old, and we were, we were rabbit hunting. And so we, we came across that big flat uh, sandstone rock. It was huge. It was probably eight, nine feet in diameter. It was just flat on the ground. And uh, we saw it and he walked around it. He was looking at it. And I asked, I asked him, I said, what does that mean, Grandpa? And he tells me, he says, oh, this is the migration of the turkey clan people. And that's what he told me. And he said, uh, he was showing me the maze. That's what that represents. He said, they're trying to get to their center, to their home, they're where they're going to live the rest of their lifestyle. I said, and so, you know, that made a lot of sense. So that's what that represents. These are the parts of um, like basically what my I was explaining about my shop looks like, and uh, these are I'm always working on a bunch of things, and uh, basically uh, usually I take pictures as work in progress. I'll send them to the clients that order things, and because uh, they like to keep record providence on their pieces, so that's what this is about. There's a picture of Joan with her hat band and some of their other her vanu buckle or keto and uh, some bracelets. And uh, she's always looks really amazing when she goes out on the bout. Another thing I do, which is not uh, in the jewelry area, but I also do, you know, prolifically, um, I mean, being an artist, I do sculpture still. And um, I mean, there's, I don't know if I'll have enough time in my life to do what I really, I wanna do so many other things. I've told Joan that I wanna get into bronzes because I have a, a colleague of mine who Prescott who owns a bronze foundry. He's been after me to do that too. But this is an amazing piece that uh, uh, Joan acquired in 
donated to the museum, the airmen. And, uh, you know, it's called uh, Thunder, Thunderstorm Over the Dragoons. And um, this is a lightning. It's all, it's a, I have another side angle of it. Uh, so it's modular. So the pieces move. And uh, it just happened that we, she was here, took a picture with her, but I don't think she'd want to see that picture because if she's wearing a hood, you can't see her, her, her whole head. So, <clears throat> so these are the best ones I had as last minute to show on our, uh, but I think that's wrapped, that's it for us. And I know people are going to have questions and uh, oh, we're going to leave some time for that. So here's one. We are seeing your entire, oh. Joan, this is the one for Joanne. How did you discover Dwayne and decide you wanted him to make jewelry for you? And how did the relationship grow? Which gets that? Yeah, how did you discover me? Yeah. 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 Something, it becomes almost an obsession. So if I see or hear anything going, like, Updated art on Dwayne and um, Wayne was at a gallery in Tucson, and I went to, to see him, see what he was doing. And he was, as you can tell, he he's good at explaining what he's doing. And I thought it was so interesting. So when he came down here to Amherst, and I came down here to see what he was up to, and that's that would be one of my recommendations for anyone interested in collecting is try to meet some of the artists in person, it, because they're all over America. They're not just here in the Southwest. Yeah. So wherever you live, there is probably a native artist who's somewhere near you. Another question for Joanne. What is your relationship like with your favorite pieces? Do those with favored status change over time? And are the favorite one attached to an experience as well? well my favorite pieces, which are some of the ones that we showed you, especially the Pedro, um, they're almost like sacred objects. If my house was on fire, I would grab them. <laughs> and, and also to be um, Wayne's pieces, but also old vintage pieces, the spirit to them that you can feel, you can sense it. And they're not just a piece of jewelry. They're not just uh, just any object like a spoon. They, they have their own spirit. And I think that that continues over time. So someday, Someone else will enjoy my pieces and they'll, they'll carry that spirit. The, the Maori have a term that it has your mana. Yeah. Your spirit from the night and it continues with the piece. It might sound mystical. Yeah, yeah, in our language, we call it ashko, which means it's the, 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 the spirit behind it. And uh, what John's referring to is um, I've been doing this work since 1974. I did the math, kind of configured about how many pieces I've done a year. When I was younger, I did maybe 400 to 500 pieces a year. When I was you know, very uh, strong and young, and slowing down. down a little bit because of the age and the meticulousness I've, been, I've gotten to be. Um, but when, there's over 25,000 of my works out there in the, in the world now. And so now what's happening is uh, collectors are, uh, uh, you know, they're not, not giving it away or whatever. Some do give it away to their their heirlooms, their legacy pieces. So, so but, but a lot of these end up, up in the second generation markets and galleries or, or museum shops. So that's something to that's, that's what John's know. referring to. Uh like some she buys also my second generation. Yeah. That kind of leads to another question. That's a delicate issue with artists uh, today, the resale market and how it can potentially devalue your work? Is that something as a collector that you think of? You know, I know you're not planning on, you know. Do you think of it as devaluing or? If people sell their parts of their pieces. A lot of the pieces, we said even Dwayne's pieces that he makes a series that's similar, they're still all very individual. And I think that over time they go up in value they're, they're kind of like, and yeah. um, that's one of the things I would recommend to collectors is buy something good or don't regret it. Don't buy 10 $10 items, buy one $100 item. Yeah, there used to be um, other patrons that always said that. And 
Instead of buying, of buying something cheap, I use my money, money up for, even if it takes several years to where I can commission Dwayne or whoever other artists, great artists, to do something really substantial that will increase in value. You know, as collectors, collectors of cars, collectors of paintings, you always see, you look for those masters and uh, eventually, you know, your work, those pieces are going to increase in value over time. And uh, I don't know how you want to look at it as an investment. Some people look at it that way. Some people just like, like it and uh, know it's got going to have value at the end. Those are the legacy things that we passed on to their, to their, to their grandchildren, so to speak. And, so, you know, we never know what they're going to be like. And uh, those grandkids might have something of great value that they can sell. Right. Also, so the good pieces you never get. Yeah, yeah that's it. They, they live on. You know, they live on the, you know, I always discover this uh, in um, another, another one of my professors in college used to say, good being, good pieces, they, they, they'll, they look just as good, you know, 50 years ago, and they'll look just as good in 50 years from now. So this is a question for Dwayne. Do you collect anything? Oh, I, 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 I know, I'm not a, um, I, collect I collect a lot of materials. To do my work. That's one thing I really have fun with. I have an amazing collection of stones of all over the world that I put into pieces. And uh, but I'm an archer. I like that. I'm a fly fisherman. Is one of my uh, how would you say my um uh, one. I just love being outdoors. So I collect. I have fishing rods and I collect flies and uh, reels. The other thing I collect as far as art goes is uh, yeah, I, enjoy I enjoy really good art. I, I enjoy really good quality of pottery, paintings, of prints, and uh, and then I also enjoy um, uh, collecting, um, uh, you know, my ceremonial stuff that I use for my dancing and my 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 uh, my, my ceremonial life. I, I when I I usually sometimes commission other. Really great craftsmen like weavers to make uh, some of the ceremonial garments that I have. And in our culture, our ancestors, my elders used to always tell us that that's, that's worth, worth more than anything that we could ever have. And then I have it, and it's a legacy piece as well. So I'll pass that down to my sons, my daughters, you know, and my family to use it for you know the future. I take really good care of those, but. Uh, yeah, but it's, you know, but I have a collection of a lot of these things. And, uh, but I would say my, 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 my wife, Jan, has a really good collection of my work because you know, she was surprised. Like, yeah. And she, she was uh, always doesn't want them sometimes when I give her something and she, she just feels like we could sell it. And I say, no, uh, you got to keep it because it's something that I'm giving to you and you can give it to the grandkids later on. So what goes into deciding who you collect and where do you usually meet those artists, find the artists that you collect? What goes into deciding who you collect and where do you usually meet them? I think some people specialize in collect like one type of thing like squash blossom necklaces, but I'd like to have a good example across the, the different parts, like a couple of small and I've got spark blossoms and some hundred belts and some finishes. And once you get into it, each different thing requires a different type of skill. Yeah. So to find a say a beautiful Zuti finish is pretty amazing too. So yeah, that would be another recommendation for collectors is pick something that you're interested in and learn as much as you possibly can about it. Yeah. You know, you know the, the artist. artist uh, I think, I think the, the benefit, benefit of being a true collector is if, if you can go directly to the artist and give them that challenge, they, they would be so much appreciative in the fact, and also the collector would be getting something very substantial, you know, in as far as a, a memory, a good story. Very meaningful because a lot of times Joan takes pictures with me with her pieces on. And I've noticed this through all the art shows I do. The Herd Museum March Fair in March, beginning of March, Santa Fe Indian Market. You know, when I people buy my work, they always want a picture with me. 
uh, you know, you know that's, that's that's cool because it's provenance of their what they're buying. You know, they they know it's a legacy piece. To give to their, their grandkids, grand children, they and they get of age. So this last question is for both of you. Um, collectors, aside from she'll purchase of a piece for, that helps the artist, they're a big part of helping the artist in being an advocate for the artist and spreading the word to other people and promoting the artist in that way. Yeah. Um, over your years of collecting and being an artist, what advice would you give to young or beginning collectors? And what advice would you be get, also give to the artist? I'll go to Joan. Collectors would be dealing with the artists themselves or dealing with very reputable dealers. Um, if you see something for 20 bucks at a roadside stand, it's probably not a piece of art. It's even a thing. Yeah. So there are, and there are plenty of places to go where you can find where you can trust what you're buying. Museum shops, the Herb Museum, the Arizona History Museum, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, Hammer Museum, they all have shops with things that are real, that are made by real artists that are genuine. And so that's, I think, one of the most important things. And a lot of the old trading post families throughout the Southwest for generations have dealt with these things and dealt directly with the artists and know what they're talking about. So that will guarantee that you get something that's real, which I think is very important. And I heard a talk about turquoise in Tucson and the geologist who had gone to the gem show who came back with six or eight alleged pieces of turquoise that weren't even turquoise. And he held them up as examples of mistakes that a person could make. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, want to, you want to spend your money on something that's real and that means something to you. And then like people say about all art, it has to speak to you. It has to be something you love. Definitely. Yeah. It has to speak to your heart. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can uh, reiterate a little bit about what John just reflected. Uh, go to a very reputable source. Whenever you go to uh, a, a dealer or a gallery or a, a shop that carries Native American, they, you know, if they stress, they carry, they carry quality handcrafted Native American art. There's another question to ask those, uh, the uh, manager or the owner of those particular establishments is do they know the artist? You know, that's, that's very important because uh, that will tell you right off the bat that there's a respect, a mutual respect between the artist and the uh, the buyer, uh, you know, we sometimes we go through uh, that that second party, which then the consumer is the third party, and so we, we also want to be as an artist represented, right, and not with a bunch of other uh, stuff in the shop that's could be uh, questionable. So that's that's why museum shops, which I stress, and um, I also work with Garlands in Sedona. Uh, they are super quality, uh, fine gallery of. Native American art, uh, Navajo rug, especially jewelry. And uh, so there are three generations that go back uh, dealing with Native American art. Very, very important. But uh, you just have to use your better judgment. Uh, once you start and you're into collecting, you'll see that you'll be learning on the way. And you'll, you'll get, uh, you'll find a network of all the other and few other friends who collect Native American art. You'll see the, 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 the a lot of the same names pop up where the bike fall material. And learning is all part of it. I'm gonna sign off and thank everybody for joining us. And I'm gonna put it back to Dwayne so he can tell you where you can see his work in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody for signing in today. Uh I'm a, also a board member of the Ameren Museum, uh three years now and um uh, it's just an honor to be, uh, you know, a representative of the Ameren, uh, the artist in residence program, which we have. We also have a new uh, concept of the, that's begun here at the Ameren, the emerging uh, native uh, artist um, uh, artist in residence program. So uh, I have to thank Joan Joan for her devout help in helping us with. Uh, the artists in residence, the, especially for the emerging uh, younger people. We've had two, we had the first two that just happened uh, last December when it was a painter from a uh, two-dimensional artist from the Tana Autumn Nation. 
and uh, the other was a, a Navajo uh, Diné poet who's in college right now, but working on a master's degree. So with that kind of support uh, in to these programs, you prolifically will see the growth of arts, especially through our museum, the Airman, which is, uh, that's where we're, we're headed, is uh, we're trying to be uh, a source, a resource for artists to come and work. And uh, I'm a living example of that. I'm my, my door is always open. If there are artists out there wanting to know about more about this, you can contact me through my, uh, I have an Instagram, Dwayne Maktima7 is my Instagram. My website is DwayneMaktima.com. And uh, I show at uh, Garlands in Sedona. That's where you can acquire my work. Uh, second generation work, you can probably find at uh, Medicine Man Gallery in, Medicine Man Gallery in Tucson. Mark Barty, Mark Botti, uh, Gallery in Tucson, Santa Fe, and Faust Gallery in, in Scottsdale and Santa Fe. And also I show at the Heard Museum gift shop and uh, Museum, of Northern Arizona Museum of Northern Arizona gift shop. They handle second generation work as well. That's where I got my start, by the way. But uh, at the Museum of Northern Arizona, I was 19 years old, 1974. I was an artist in residence there. So I thank you everybody for attending and um, look forward to probably doing more of these again down the road. Thank you.